Why the fuck didn't any of my doctors tell me this? Why didn't they check it? Because the medical industry is not here to make you healthy. The medical industry is here to make money. So if I give you, let's say you're 40 years old and you have all these ailments and I give you one drug that costs you 120 bucks a month and now you're off all your medications, you feel great. What did I just do? I just cost Big Pharma a lot of money. So that's really what we're doing. We're looking at hormones from an anti-aging and a health preservation perspective. What is up, guys? This is CEO Luke Lintz hosting this episode of the High Key Podcast, where we dive deep into the lives and success stories of top entrepreneurs across various different industries. Today on the show, we have Tomo Marjanovic, and he is a multi-million dollar health and wellness entrepreneur, former award-winning law enforcement officer. His company is called Aspire Rejuvenation Medical Center based out of Orlando and Pittsburgh. He's expanding widely. And today I'm really excited about this episode. If you know me, you know that I have a lot of priority in my life dedicated towards the health and wellness space. And that's what Tomo's company is completely all about. And so I think we're going to have an extremely good conversation, dive deep into the success, the success story path of Tomo and basically how he got there and then a lot of aspects of health and wellness. So thanks for being here, Tomo. Hey, thanks for having me, Luke. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course. So the way we like to start off these podcasts is a bit different than other people's podcasts. And we like going all the way back. We kind of like going childhood even high school we think it brings out a lot of relatability points to the audience where it can showcase different avenues different turning points that brought you to the success that you have today gotcha. and so with that in terms of like your upbringing tomo and really your childhood like do you have any pivotal memories or really like influential things that happened in your childhood uh, yeah, so uh, definitely some pivotal memories. Um, I'm a typical, uh, you know, 80s to 90s kid. I'm a little bit older than you, Luke. I think you're in your 20s, right? Um, I'm, I'm 23. Be, uh, you're 23. I'm going to be 38. So I'm the old man in this conversation. I'm going to be 38. I was born in 1985 uh, to immigrant parents. Both my uh, mom and dad immigrated from Croatia. Uh, you know, uh, usually uh, during, both of them pretty much during the uh, Yugoslav conflicts you know, the wars, there was communism there. So they fled communism, my grandparents as well. And they came to the United States. And, you know, we were raised uh, in that mindset. We were raised in the mindset of, hey, we came from a communist country. The only way you're going to make it in America and achieve that American dream, uh, you know, so to speak, is by working your ass off, uh, by making sure that you do everything you can to be successful, treat people the right way, uh, assimilate into the culture, uh, and, you know, I'm technically a uh, third or fourth generation entrepreneur if I really look far enough back, um, both on my mom's and my dad's side. Uh, but my grandparents, when they came here, they got into the bar and restaurant industry and they still own a bar up in Ohio right now. They're 81 and 83 years old. Uh, so they're still working every single day. And my grandmother is in that kitchen cooking 83 years old every single day. So I grew up in a, an environment where you were working. It was always work. You were always working. You were always focused on, you know, making money, doing the right things, getting things done. And there was no, there was no, you know, lackadaisical effort. There was no, you know, can I swear on your podcast, Luke? Are we allowed to swear on here? 100%. Perfect. I don't want to podcast. drop too many of them, but you know, <laughs> there was no half ass in it, man. There's no half assing it in our family. And that was instilled from an extremely early age. Uh, but like I said, from kids being raised in the 80s and 90s, grew up in a single family household. My uh, father and mother got divorced when I was pretty young, seven, eight years old. Uh, you know, a little known fact about me, uh, I had a stepfather who committed suicide when I was in my late, early teens. So I was wow. like 13, 14 years old. So traumatic experiences with father figures, you know, for me when I was growing up. Uh, thankfully, I had a lot of really good friends and I had a lot of really good friends' fathers that kind of helped instill that masculine uh, energy and that masculine influence on me. But, you know, I was I was a kid who was raised on watching Arnold Schwarzenegger movies and watching Jean-Claude Van Damme and all these like 80s and 90s macho, macho movies. So, you know, for me, I had to look for outside influence when it came to finding 
uh, somebody that was a masculine figure. So I, I leaned on my friends' fathers. I leaned on movie stars and celebrities, and I tried to emulate them. So you know, watching Arnold and all those guys, I uh, got into bodybuilding at age like 13. You know, so I, that's how I got into the fitness industry at a very early age. Started working out, found mentors in the gym, and you know that's what started me on my fitness journey, which led into my hormone journey, which led into my entrepreneurship. Really, wow, that that's amazing. And to like recap, there, I I think there are two like major points that you said in terms of like coming from an immigrant family is basically instilling in you the work ethic at a very young age that you work hard to get anywhere in life. And even like your, your older people that you were looking up to in life at that time were working at such an old age. And so that instilled into you. And then uh, the aspects of, well, well extreme trauma probably from uh, <laughs> the death of step, your stepdad that, that, that's extremely, uh, yeah, that, that can definitely affect things. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, yeah. and, and those kind of yeah. things, those kind of things haunted me for a while when I was growing up younger, you know what I mean? And I mean, when you're when you're a younger kid, it's uh, you don't really you don't really want to talk about it. You kind of just bottle it up. Right. Um, and I, I tell everybody and I'm, I'm a big I'm a big preacher of, you know, being able to heal yourself and being able to accept what happened in life where, you know, I in my early, in my early uh, adulthood, I was a cop for 12 years. So before I got into business and entrepreneurship, I was a police officer for 12 years. I saw the nastiest shit you could possibly see. You know, I saw deaths. I saw, um, you know, uh, children dying. I've seen gunshots. I've been involved in shooting experiences and shooting situations. I've seen a lot of stuff, you know, and that, that stuff haunted me for a while too. So, you know, when all that stuff builds up, you really have to get your self into a mindset where you look at everything as like, yes, that happened. And yes, those things hurt. But is it still hurting? So is it still getting me right now? Um, and that's what I try to explain to everybody that always talks about past stuff. Oh, my father. Oh, my mother. Oh, my ex. And they blame, blame, blame. And they don't actually look at it like, hey, that happened. But it's not happening now. The only reason you're still feeling that pain is because you're allowing it to still hurt you. So, you know, having the mindset of acceptance and accepting that these things happen to you and just let them go. You know, you can't you can't blame your father forever. You can't blame your ex forever. You can't blame that that horrible situation that you witnessed or were a part of forever. Um, you only got this one life. I mean. Maybe you don't. If we get reincarnated, that's sweet. I'd like to have another go at it, you know, but we only have this one life from what we understand. You got to make the best of it. Don't waste time focusing on all the bullshit, you know? Yeah, that's like the victim mentality where people are just, yeah, victimizing their entire lives when they could be using it for uh, giving them perspective and moving forward from it. Well, there's a ton of things I want to dive into from everything that you said, Tomo. One aspect is from your perspective, like you actually have a great perspective on this coming from an immigrant family and first generation U.S. Uh, basically, what do you see as uh, kind of like the differences and how, say, basically the younger generation is growing up in the u.s now where i would personally say that the work ethic isn't there across the board in the u.s for the younger generation and there's so many an infinite amount of distractions so i'd love for you to dive in on that topic of, of basically your thoughts on that compared to coming from like an immigrant family yeah so i mean you look at i can i can give you a perfect example to start this conversation off and, and just look at my staff in my clinic um, like 90% of my clinic staff here in Florida, they're all foreign. They're all from other countries. We have people from Peru, from Puerto Rico, from Cuba, you know, all over the place. And every single one of them are workers, man, they work. And then you look at how kids are growing up here in the United States and you're up in Canada. It's, you know, it's still westernized culture. Um, you know, we, we have a, a lot of European friends and stuff like that. It's trickling over there too. So don't, we're not going to fool ourselves. Um, the only place that's really teaching uh, the children how to work really, really hard, Asian culture and Middle Eastern culture. Those are the ones that are really instilling this hard work ethic. And the reason why they're doing that is because they have more of a, I don't want to make it political or apolitical, but they have more of a conservative mindset when it comes to work ethic, when it comes to working hard, when it comes to business and success. 
they they understand that there is no free lunch, you know, because they've been through shit. You go to the Middle East, every single one of those countries in the Middle East has been through war recently. Not like in the last, like, 100 years, like in the last 20 years, you know what I mean? They've all been through conflicts, and you look in, uh, you know, Eastern... Eastern Europe, uh, Croatia, where I'm from, we were just in a war in 97. I was there in 1997, the year the war ended. So it's like, you know, when people are looking at it from that aspect, there is something missing in our culture right now. There's something missing uh, in what's happening with the people that are growing up here, where it's like, you know, how, how can you... How can you? Co- well, you're talking about you're, you're you're talking about an amazing topic here. That was a, a good uh, past friend of mine was talking okay. about in terms of the aspect of hard times create strong men. Hundred percent. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men, mm-hmm. and then weak men create hard times, and it's like a cycle that goes around. Yep. And you're, you're basically talking about based off of your location and where you're living, like in in Europe and stuff, and in these these other countries were basically they have a harder working mentality is because they're they kind of to. in a situation yeah, where it's hard, they hard. They choice. they're not going to eat if yeah. they don't work hard yeah we're here everybody's handed everything now and you know everybody like listen if anybody in the western part of the world canada united states mexico will leave aside because it's still very third world country there um but if we look at canada and the united states where where you and i are from right where we're at right now so if we look at North America in general, we have it so good here. We don't have to worry about shelter. We don't have to worry about food. We don't have to worry about clean water for the most part. You know, we, we have everything. Like, And you see people complaining, oh, well, I don't have all these opportunities that I see all these wealthy people have. You got to go work for it. <laughs> you know, it's that, it's that victimhood and it's that... Uh, it's that mentality where I deserve all of these things without having to put in the effort. Um, and it's, it's a culture thing. It's not, it's not just uh, what culture is doing. It's what parenting are doing. Parents are afraid to push their children, which is, I grew up, my, you know, my mother, who you know, is the one who raised us, she's like, you can do absolutely anything you want. You just got to work your ass off and do it. You just got to work your ass off and get it. There is nothing that can stop you, you know? So it's, it's a culture thing and it's going to have to, it's going to have to change, but things are going to get really hard here, uh, in the near future because, you know, these, uh, these times are going to create very weak men and very weak women. And we're already seeing it. We're already seeing these new generations. They don't want to work. They want handouts. They, they don't want to, uh, push themselves. They don't want to go through the pain. And I know for a fact, Luke, you have went through a lot of pain to get this business going. I know I went through a lot of pain to get my businesses going. I have cried myself to sleep. I have woke up crying. I have looked at payroll costs and I'm like, oh my God, I don't know if I'm going to I don't know if I'm make payroll this week. I've been there, you know? So like if you don't get yourself in that, in that mindset, you're just not going to succeed. And that's why we have a bunch of people that just are kind of lost. These are like new lost generations. And it started with my generation, it started with the millennials. And, you know, these newer generations, they're even worse. They're, they're having even more problems. Dude, and the aspect of like social media and the role that social media plays in this, these clips are going to be posted across all social media platforms. Mm -hmm. And I think that it puts, especially in the younger generation, that's a bit more impressionable where uh, it it definitely creates where they're looking on other people's lives, very voyeuristic and comparing themselves to other people. And with you being in the health and wellness space, like people who come into your clinic, is there anything that that you see, like, I know you talk about how a lot of things is to do with their lifestyle first before mm-hmm. going into different like medicines that make sense. Like, do you see problems like with people's mental coming into play in a lot of different things, especially with like social media and stuff? hundred percent. So, you know, uh, obviously you, you owning high key and, and doing all the PR stuff that you do, you guys are very tied in with social media. Uh, I, I am very tied in with social media. I built my brands on this. I think it's a constant comparison game for most people um, where they're looking. And I mean, listen, you're a successful guy. I, I don't know. I don't know what your net worth is, but I assume that you have a lot of money. And I hope you do. I hope you have millions of dollars. I hope you're driving a Lamborghini every day. You know what I mean? But when people look at you driving a Lamborghini or when people look at me driving my Aston Martin, 
um, you know, it, they are they are only looking at that little part. They're only looking at that little success thing, and they forget to see what what has really gone into that to get there. They don't look at the sleepless nights. They don't look at the they don't look at the tears. They don't look at you had to go damn near bankrupt to get this company started. That you had to work twenty hour days, sleep two hours, still get your workout in, still do all these things. You know they don't they don't look at anything like that. They don't they're not appreciating the journey, and they want results. Everybody is instant results now, so they they want everything immediately. Well, I want my Lamborghini, and then you know put yourself in the last three four years. Crypto culture, cryptocurrency. You had a bunch of kids invest in some stupid ass meme coins. Make a bunch of millions of dollars, and they're posting their Lamborghinis, posting their houses, traveling all over the world. It's not a real thing. It's not real. This is real. This this office that I pay for is real. Your offices that you pay for is real. You know the the production team behind this podcast. These are real people working. You know this is how money is actually made. This is how people actually get started. And I I try to I try to tell anybody young that asks me. I, I have people ask me. You know when I'm. When I'm driving around, I'll have like younger people. Dude, how, how did you? And they also don't think I'm 38. Thank God I have a good anti aging <laughs> So, you know, they think I'm like in my early 30s or something or even my late 20s sometimes. Dude, you I, look like your late 20s, man. You look like 20. I'm going to totally take that compliment. <laughs> so they look at me and they're like, how did you get that car? How did you get your success? How did you how did you get your Rolex? And I'm like, dude, I spent a lot of years working on this. You know, it's there's not a quick trick. There's not a there's not a tip or a trick, and anybody that tells you that, and anybody watching this, I, I hope they understand this. Anybody telling you there is a quick way to make real money is lying. They're trying to sell you something. There is no quick way. The quick way is doing the work. The quick way is putting in long hours and really suffering for it. And if you understand that, the more you suffer for it, the more you'll succeed. You're going to be golden. Dude, this is amazing, man. This podcast is going to be great for <laughs> just the audience and for short form clips. This is going to be stellar, bro. Uh, I want you to take me into, uh, you, you gave me like the prelude of basically your childhood and then like a brief overview of getting up to where you are now. But you went into law enforcement, did you say 12 to 13 years? 12 years. Uh, from 2000, 12. I went to police academy in 2007. Um, started working in 2007, and I retired from law enforcement in 2018. So I, I want to know the two transitional periods with that, because I think a lot of people in our audience are either of the younger generation and getting into the workforce mm -hmm. or potentially people who are in the workforce and just aren't happy at a nine to five. And sure. so I want to know those two transitional periods of what got you into law enforcement where you thought like, obviously if you were there for 12 years, you thought that that was probably going to be your, your lifelong career, I would assume. And then what got you out of law enforcement? And I assume you transitioned directly into the business from law enforcement. Yeah, so it's a funny story. My law enforcement career started almost on a dare. It was not my dream to be a police officer. It was never my dream to be. A, yeah, I know. This is, I, when I tell people the story, they're like, you're completely full of shit. There's no way this happened. It happened. I was in college, uh, going nowhere. I didn't know what I wanted to major and changed my major like three times. I was 21 years old. Um, so 21 years old, I think my third year in college, uh, Cleveland State University. And um, switching majors like crazy. I have no clue what the hell I'm going to do. Lost in college. Hated school, by the way. So anybody that doesn't like school, um, don't be afraid of that. I, I, have, uh, I have so many people that have business degrees that you know, I knew from my past. Um, they're all running McDonald's or something like that now. Like they have a McDonald's or a manager making nothing. You know what I mean? So going to school for business or going to school for whatever you uh, think you might want to do. Most of the entrepreneurs that I know do not have any background in the business that they're running right now. So I'll just, I'll just start off with that. So I was in college, um, personal training at the time, because I was you know a gym guy. So I'm personal training at the time. My two friends that lived across the way from me, both just graduated from police academy. Uh, names are uh, Jeremy Prokop. Yes, his real name is Prokop, his last name. <laughs> um, works for the federal government now. And uh, another guy, uh, Bill Brooks, uh, who works for a police department up in Ohio. 
And uh, those guys told me, like, man, you know, you don't know what you're doing in college. You know, he's like, why don't, why don't you just go try police academy? You'll get through all the physical stuff. Now, back then, you had to take a physical test to get in academy. Now, you can be a fat slob and get in academy, and then they expect you to just pass the test at the end of the academy. Um, back then, it was a lot harder. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't even think I realized 2007 was quite a long time ago. So, you know, we're talking getting close to 20 years ago. Uh, so I, I went to try out for no reason. Didn't want to be a cop. So I go, I take the physical test, do the mile and a half, push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups, all that stuff, pass it, flying colors, no problem. And then like three weeks later, I was in police academy. That's literally how my law enforcement career got started. I did not have any, <laughs> I, I just, what happened? I'm like, I have to do something was in my head. You know, I'm like, I have to do something. I'm big, I'm strong, you know, this police stuff looks cool. My two friends just did it. Why not? Let's give it a try. And that's-, so, that's so was that at, was that the same time as uh, like potentially wanting to become a bodybuilder? Like you, you were bodybuilding during that was, time as well? Yeah, so I was already, I was already competitive bodybuilding from age 17. So, you know, I, I did my first competition at age 17. I uh, did another one at 19 and then I think another one at 20. Um, and then I kind of hung up my competing and I went into law enforcement, but I never really stopped bodybuilding. I always was bodybuilding. I've always worked out. Um, I, I was up at 5.30 this morning working out. I, I, I work out five or six days a week. It's part of my life, just like having breakfast is. You know what I mean? Just like drinking water is, just like going to sleep is. I don't function unless I have my exercise. It's just part, sure. of, it's just part of my life, you know? So yeah, I mean, I got into law enforcement uh, next thing I knew, I was I was working uh, back then. Uh, you had to work part time first, um, so I actually worked part time my first agency for free because in Ohio you had to hold your commission. So if you didn't get a job within the first year, you lost your commission for police officer. So I went and worked for a very small village agency outside of Cleveland, Ohio, and I worked for one dollar a year. So I literally was on patrol pulling people over for zero dollars, putting my life on the line because that's what I needed to do to get my career, you know? So the only way I made money during that time was working side jobs after my 40 hours. So you had to work your full 40 hours for free and then you had to work your side jobs to make your money. That's how I started my law enforcement career. So, you know, when I hear people like, oh, I don't wanna do my nine to five job, I don't wanna do this. I just look at people and I'm like, listen, you got to make money. You can't live without this shit. You got to put yourself through some shit to get there. You know, so when 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 people look at it like, oh, well, I don't want to lower myself to, to go and work for this job, that job. You know, I, I have a perfect story for you. When I was a police officer in Clearwater, Florida, um, closer to the end of my police career, I had a guy who was homeless, sleeping in a tent behind a Walgreens. 23, 24 year old guy. I go up to him because we got a call from Walgreens. Hey, get the guy off the property. I, I come up to him, pretty clean cut. Doesn't look like he's been homeless long, you know, and he's got a tent and he's got like a little radio. He's got an iPhone. I'm like, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> you know? So I'm like, why are you sleeping behind Walgreens? And well, you know, I look at his ID. His ID says he's a Clearwater address. I'm like, whose address is this? So like, oh, it's my parents. I'm like, what happened to your parents? And he said, he said they kicked me out. So why'd they kick you out? He tells me because I couldn't find a job. I said, bro, Walgreens is hiring right here. McDonald's is hiring right across the street. What do you mean you can't find a job? He said, I went to school for IT and I will not lower myself to go and work for McDonald's. And I literally looked at him. I said, but you're not too opposed to lowering yourself to the point of sleeping on the streets and having a cop kick you out of someone else's property. I, I was baffled by this, you know? baffled and this is like this is probably in like 2017 18 like right before i left law enforcement so this is this is just craziness to me but that's the attitude right now you know that's the attitude so you know when i was in law enforcement i had a very i had a very different approach to to uh how i did my job i did it because i used to get in trouble with the cops i ran from the cops when i was a kid i used to do all kinds of stupid shit you know we would run from cops on our motorcycles I may or may not have done that when I was uh, actually a cop. Uh, so I didn't get a ticket. <laughs> you know, I don't care about saying it now. It is what it is. They're not going to come after me now about it. But, you know, I, I, uh, 
I always had a healthy respect for cops, but I always saw people look at them negatively. So I always went about my life with treating everybody exactly the same and treating everybody with respect until they gave me a reason not to. So like I would go and my fellow officers thought I was crazy sometimes, especially up in, uh, in Cleveland and then in this little area called uh, Greenwood in Clearwater, I would go up to people and I would shake everybody's hand. I don't care. Black, white, Hispanic, gang member, crack dealer on the street. I gave respect to everybody. Even when I got in fights with people, I'd get in fist fights with these guys after chasing them. You know what I mean? Um, so I get in a chase, we get in a fist fight and you know, I'd obviously win and I handcuff them up and I'd like, I'd give them a little slap on the ass and I'd say, you gotta get that knuckle game up a little bit. I'm like, you, you don't fight so well. And they laughed. And they got a kick out of it. You know what I mean? So they looked at it like, okay, this dude's okay. He's not just trying to hem me up for any reason. I broke the law. He's not whooping my ass. He just arrested me. He gave me respect. And then the next time I saw that guy, they would give me a little head nod or they'd shake my hand. They'd dap me up. Like it, it was a, it was a really cool experience for me because I think if you just treat everybody like people and not look at them like criminals or anything else, the respect automatically comes. I I feel like you probably took a lot of that into what you're currently doing in terms of your business. And yeah, I, I, I absolutely respect that a ton. In terms of the transition period of getting out of law enforcement in 2017, what was that specific transition period? Did you go right into creating your clinic? No, no. So this is a little bit of a more nuanced story. Um, I, I was in law enforcement. I was trying to transition out of the police department. I was applying for different federal positions. I applied for the FBI, got through all the testing until the physical test. And I'm like, screw it. I don't want to be law enforcement anymore. I just, it literally went there. Um, so when I was in law enforcement, uh, towards the end of my career, 2016, the climate started to change and they started not really allowing you to do your job to the point where like I was getting yelled at for harassing the local community. I worked in an all black community. I'm a white guy. You can see how clearly I am white. I worked in an all black community, <laughs> very high crime, a lot of crack sales, a lot of dealing, a lot of gangs, things like that. And I got yelled at for doing my job, for going after dealers, for going out, for getting guns off the street. And I got yelled at by a patrol major basically saying like, hey, you have to stop harassing the locals. I'm like, you mean the crack dealer? Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, these are criminals. I'm, I'm doing my job. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. And the, and the law abiding people in that community actually appreciate it. So everything just turned really racial and everything turned very negative. You know, mm -hmm. where it's like cops are bad. Um, you know, I'm harassing people because they're black. I'm like, dude, I'm like, honestly, I would quicker. I would, be, I would quickly pull over a white person coming into this neighborhood because no white people live in the neighborhood before I pull over a black person because the white people were there to buy drugs. I knew they were there to buy drugs. They didn't live there. That was the community that that was, you know. So it just turned very sour. They wouldn't let me do my job the right way. And I just basically checked out and I kept trying to figure out what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do. And one of my guys is like, why don't you go try to work for this medical clinic, you know, where I was getting testosterone therapy. That's how my personal hormone journey started. I was like 30, 31 years old. Um, after working a decade on midnight shift, all of my hormones went in the tank. My testosterone level dropped by like 50%. You know, because you're sleeping like shit. You're stressed out all the time. It's, yep. You're not eating right. So I started to see myself gaining belly fat, getting a little bit depressed, you know, not just feeling myself, no sex drive, all of these telltale signs of low testosterone, which I knew because I studied hormones from age 13 on. You know, I wanted to be a bodybuilder. So I know all this stuff. So I go and get a prescription from this clinic. Testosterone levels go back up. And I'm, I'm off the race. I'm back to me. I'm back to where I need to be, right? So I'm leaving law enforcement, and I go and ask the owner of this clinic for a job. And he's like, I'm like, do you have anybody doing sales and marketing? He's like, no, but actually I've been really looking for somebody. I'm friends with this guy. Um, and he's like, you have anybody in mind? I said, me. He said, you're a cop. What are you talking about? And I'm like, I want to leave law enforcement. Let me come work for you. And he immediately asked, what do you want? And I said, I just need you to match my police salary. 
He was like, what's your police salary? So I put it down on a piece of paper. I gave it to him, and he laughed. <laughs> Cops don't get paid a lot of money, just so you know. Not really a big secret. So I put it on the piece of paper, and, uh, and he's hired me on the spot. Um, about a couple days later, I resigned from law enforcement. Uh, I went on a cruise for a week with a bunch of friends, kind of like decompress. And uh, next thing I knew, I was working at this medical clinic, and I built this uh, clinic in the same realm of what I do now. Um, I built this clinic from like 700 patients to almost 4,000 in like nine months. Just, wow. just based on social media, um, based on outreach, based on making videos before reels were around. You know, uh, it was like making these short clip videos, putting them on Facebook, doing lives on Facebook. It was awesome. So we built this brand up. He makes me part owner, gives me 20% of the company. And uh, a few weeks after that, I get a call from a uh, DEA agent um, who I can't disclose. And he tells me, asks me a question, hey, are you part of this clinic? Are you part owner? And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, why? What's up? He said, there's a bunch of felony investigations against the owner of this clinic and this clinic. This guy's basically selling illegal steroids out the door. So, no. I swear to God. So, you know, and this is still ongoing. There's an active investigation going on right now, which is why I'm not going to give any specifics or names. Um, anybody that watches this that knows me personally knows exactly who and what I'm talking about. But... There's a bunch of illegal stuff going on. So I say, how long do I have? Um, and he basically says, he's like, you know, he's like, I would get the hell out of there like now. So I tell the guy and I'm like, listen, let me try to fix this. I, I tell this agent, you know, I start calling my local DEA guys that I've worked with and my local law enforcement guys that I've worked with. I'm like, hey, is this true? Is this all, is this all legit? Everybody's like, yeah, there's some problems there. I said, okay. So we get, we get going and I start confronting him and I'm like, hey, this is what I'm hearing. He denies, denies, denies. I'm like, let me fix it. Let me get this place where it needs to be. I will absolutely, you know, uh, help you keep this company going and you keep making your money. All I want is 20%. You keep paying me 20%. You just step aside. Let me run the show for a little bit and let me get us back on track doing it the right way, right? Refused, refused, selfish. You know what I mean? This is what it is. And then I start catching them selling drugs right in front of me. Like, I don't know if you know, like, anabolic steroids or not, but, like, I'm catching them selling D-ball. Typical bodybuilding drug, 100% illegal in the United States, can't prescribe it. And I'm seeing a hand-to-hand -hand deal for cash in the clinic, in the medical clinic that I'm working at. And I just eventually can't take it anymore. I end up leaving um, in August of, uh, what is that, August of 2019. And I'm like, I, I left that office and I walked into the Tampa DEA office <laughs> and I gave my statement. So, you know, I'm on the other side of the law enforcement desk now. So this is a very uncomfortable situation for me. Uh, you know, and if you know anything about federal cases in the United States, they take forever. So this is still ongoing. Yeah. This is still going on. Um, the owner of that clinic that I used to work for is suing me. I'm very open about that, too. He's suing me for... Uh, um, what is it? Violation of my uh, employment contract. Um, he has no basis. It's all bullshit. He just wants to, he wanted to try to close me. He wanted to try to shut me down by racking up lawyer's fees. Typical move, you know. Uh, gratefully, I had, a, uh, I had a lawyer who basically pro boned it until I could pay him. So I, I'm, I'm, you know, super grateful that I have friends like that. But yeah, that's how my, I didn't want to start my own business. I was forced, I was pushed to do it. Dude, that is not that is a crazy story. Wow. I mean, I I'm, wow. I'm I'm going to eventually put this into into text. I'm eventually going to put this into into writing. Um, I can't do it yet because of the legal uh, case, so I can't even put yeah. anything down on paper in that in that aspect. But I've talked very openly about it. My lawyer doesn't like when I talk about it. I don't care. This is the truth. And if there's one thing that you're ever going to hear about me is that I'm honest. Um, it's that I always want to tell the truth and that I have integrity. I'm not going to bullshit people. I'm not going to lie to people. Integrity for me is above anything else. I would rather go broke than lose that. So I tell everybody exactly how this is. But yeah, man, I mean, that's how I got into business. And, you know, I put my entire life savings into starting this. Uh, you know, you, you can ask my family members. You can ask my, 
ex-girlfriends at the time. Uh, I used to go into the office before I walked up into my old office here in Orlando because I had to leave. I had to be 50 miles away. So I opened up a new office in Orlando from Tampa, uh, 53 miles away, <laughs> right outside of that. Dude, dude, there was just so much brute force in this story, like all the way from in like going into law enforcement mm -hmm. and working for basically for free and then having a side job where like the risk to reward wasn't even that good like y you said it yourself law enforcement doesn't make that much money no. and so you were working for free for a year just to keep something like that's how much of a hard worker you are <laughs> like just brute force and then going into <laughs> going into the medical clinic and then oh my god getting wrapped up into that with all of this like speaking to the audience like you were forced into business 100 percent. do you do you think that's how people should be choosing their business career if they don't understand or like are basically on the fence like think entrepreneurship could be for them like or do you really think everybody's just on their own journey i would tell i would say everybody's on your own journey but with shades of gray because you know i when i had to leave that job I had a choice. I could have went back into law enforcement. I could have went and found a law enforcement job. Um, I could have went back into the agency that I was at. I was welcome back. Um, I was told that I was welcome back. I could have went into the federal government. I had plenty of education, accolades, awards, um, you know, things like that that are that were fine. Uh, but I said, you know what? I'm not leaving law enforcement. I'm not letting this guy, you know, hurt what I actually love to do. So, you know, maybe if my best advice to anybody that wants to get into entrepreneurship is just find something you like, find something that you have a little bit of passion about. Um, and there's gurus out there that'll say, no, that's bullshit. Do the thing that, you know, do the thing that will make you the most money. And like, that's fine if you want to behave that way. But I, I'm, a, I'm a person that has to wake up happy. You know what I mean? I want to wake up and be excited to come to my office. I want to I want to wake up and be excited to come and talk to you, you know, on a podcast about my business journey. I want to be excited about my medical clinics helping now now I think 8,000 patients. You know, we have 8,000 active patients with the medical clinics. I, I I need to be excited about that. We're like I don't know if I if I owned if I owned a, a restaurant, I'm not, I'm not excited about restaurants. I'm not excited about owning a bar. Can they make a lot of money? Hell yeah, they can. My grandparents have supported, you know, three generations of family with their restaurant and bar, but it's just not my thing. So maybe my best advice is to, you know, if you want to get into entrepreneurship, be very prepared to suffer, be very prepared to be very broke. I didn't pay myself for almost two years in business and thank God for my wife now, my girlfriend at the time, uh, she fed me, you know, I met her, um, I met her very early into starting this business and I was living in this little shithole apartment here in Orlando and I still own my condo in Clearwater and she basically was bringing me food cause I couldn't afford groceries. I had to pay payroll. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, dude, I mean, that's an unbelievable relationship. Why well, she, she was there, you know, when I asked her this all the time, I said, I said, you know, why would you, why would you have gone with me, you know, would you have done it again, knowing I was broke, knowing I had no, you know, I had a fucking horrible credit score. You know, it's good now, but I had to literally leverage everything. I wasn't paying my mortgage on my condo. I wasn't paying my car payment. I wasn't paying credit cards because I leveraged everything I had to put it into this business. So I could pay payroll, so I could get this business going because I knew if I took that one business from 700 patients to 4,000, Nobody cared about that business that was following me on social media that was wanting to be a part of that business that I brought in. They cared about me. So all that mattered was that I that I put myself out there, that I put the information out there, and that I just went all in. And anything entrepreneurship, if you're not willing to go all in, just fold it up. You, you gotta you gotta be the one doing it. I, I tell my staff all the time and you know, between two offices I I uh, I have I don't know, twenty something staff, uh, not including my corporate side. Uh, I tell them, I'm like, I've done every one of your jobs. I said, because when we started, <laughs> I was patient care. I was front desk. Uh, I was doing shipping. I was, I was doing everything. So I've done every single job in that place. You can't tell me your job's hard. I know how to do it. <laughs> you know? That shows a great leader because then you're able to draw perspective and basically allocate like 
what is effective and what is actually producing in all those specific positions. Like that's what a really good manager is, exactly. is when they have actually done the grunt work because then they have that perspective of actually doing it. And I totally agree about the component of getting into entrepreneurship and business about how it should be an area that you like and passion first mm -hmm. because there's so much failures and the aspect of having to go all in that you just won't do it on a consistent basis and you won't do it on a long enough time horizon if it's not an extreme passion of yours. Yeah. If it's just something that you're doing to make money, like you have to have something greater in terms of external motivation than just money. Um, one thing I wanted to segue into, I, I, I was I was thinking about this as you were talking because I thought it was like pretty funny. But uh, in law enforcement, you said you got out of the business mm -hmm. kind of because uh, how how you were getting a bad rep basically as a cop, which I think it got worse and worse after about 2017 and 2018, like the Black Lives Matter movement, like oh, yeah. just completely destroyed cops image. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. it's, and it really is a shame because it's, you know, it, the cops are so necessary and people are like, oh, well, you know, people have always kind of, uh, cops have always had a negative rep in, in the community. You, nobody wants to get pulled over. Nobody wants to get a ticket. Nobody wants a cop showing up to their house. Right. So nobody wants any of these things to happen, but when you need them, you really need them. You know, when your car gets stolen, when your house gets burglarized, when you get in a car accident, you need a cop. It's very important to have them. Um, you know, and, and that all kind of started the negative, the negative behavior that I saw. It's a pendulum. It goes back and forth every 15, 20 years. It's been like that since the beginning of the United States. They're loved for a little bit, then they're hated for a little bit, and then it just keeps going back and forth. It got really bad during the Obama years. And again, I don't want to bring politics into it, but he just wasn't very cop friendly. That's fine. Not a big deal. You know, and then uh, ever since that, again, with the Black Lives Matter movement, it got it got very negative again uh, towards police officers. I kind of thankfully missed that. I left at a very good time. Uh, you know, I, I, I always thought of police work as you're there to do a job. But again, I had a pr different perspective. I was very respectful to everybody. I never wanted to, I never wanted to arrest anybody. I almost never wrote a, a traffic ticket. If I pulled you over, it's because I thought you were doing something else very wrong. You know what I mean? So like if I pulled you over, mm -hmm. you get a warning. Like if I just pull you over and you're speeding, I'm not going to pin you with a $400 speeding ticket. That's horrible of me to do, you know? But if you're Mr. Dope Dealer, and you happen to be speeding, and I know you got dope in the car, well, now I'm going to pull you over for my probable cause stop for speeding, and I'm going to get the dope out of the car because I know you're selling crack in the neighborhood. You know what I mean? And, like, I, I was yeah. I was a guy, and, you know, again, they can't come after me now, so I don't care about saying it, but, like, if I caught anybody with a little bit of weed or something like that, I've never once had a problem with somebody that smoked weed in my life. They were always super chill. They were always super cool. So if I caught somebody with a little bit of weed... And there's nothing else wrong, yeah. Stomp that out. We're gonna grind that into the concrete, and you're gonna go about your day because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pin somebody on a drug charge, some twenty-something-year-old kid or a teenager, and ruin their life. You know, and I can get into that too. I mean, marijuana should be legal anyway. It's like the most, you know. I mean, alcohol. We have more problems with that in this country and in the world than we do from marijuana ever. You know, so I, I just had a different attitude. But then when I couldn't do my job anymore and everything turned into, you know, oh, Tomo, you're, you're doing this wrong or Tomo, you're harassing these people or this and that. I'm like, I'm not harassing anybody. I'm just trying to do my job, you know. Yeah. So it, it just turned stale to me and I just didn't want to do it anymore. And uh, when you see the caliber of police officers getting into the industry now, getting into police work now, you can kind of see what I mean. Nobody wants to be a cop anymore. It used to be big, heavy hitters, you know. I'm 6'3", 240 pounds. I'm a large guy. I'm an athlete. You know what I mean? I've bodybuilding my whole life. We used to get these ex-military guys. We used to get these guys that were uh, athletes, football players in college that wanted to be cops because they wanted to go out there. They wanted to bust the bad guys. They wanted to help people. You know, and that's their job. They're going to make some money. Now, everybody's like, I don't want to deal with this bullshit. I don't want to deal with everybody hating me because, I, because of my career choice. You know? And people forget it's just a person behind that badge. It's just it's like it's like all of us here, you know, we're we're all just people. It's just it's just work. 
Very true. Very true. I'm 6'3", 210, so I'm more of a basketball build. Oh, I like well, I'm like probably safe. supposed to be 210. Um, I just eat too much food. <laughs> It, it, in terms of uh, in terms of bad reps in general, and like kind of how how it transitions into the current industry that you're in of health and wellness, I know a major thing that your clinics do is HRT, like h- hormone replacement mm-hmm. therapy. I definitely want to dive into that, but I I personally think that there's kind of a stigma with definitely definitely anything related to testosterone in terms of the stigma of testosterone in general. And I know a component of hormone replacement therapy is testosterone. So I would love for you to talk about that stigma specifically and how hormone replacement therapy is different than like drug dealers selling testosterone illegally. Yeah. So I, I try to tell everybody the same thing. Like the reason that any hormones like testosterone or any anabolic hormones like that even have a bad rep is because of baseball. And everybody says that's crazy. Why would you even say that? It really is because of baseball. That's the reason that it's on the controlled substance list. Testosterone is a bioidentical hormone. You have it in your body, I have it in my body. Our wives, girlfriends, mothers, daughters have it in their body as well, just at a much lesser amount. But things like testosterone are natural. So, you know, this is just medicine. Um, And there's a big difference that I want to point out between the abuse factor in bodybuilding, you know, or, or in athletics in general, and a therapeutic factor. They're two completely different spectrums, but with the same drug. So, you know, if, if I take testosterone, and I, I will admit I have abused testosterone in the past. I have taken way too much testosterone, and my testosterone levels were massively through the roof. I was a bodybuilder. Bodybuilders are kind of stupid. I'll, I'll be the first one to admit it, you know. So I've taken this abuse amount of testosterone, and that's when all these negative side effects start to happen. That's when it starts to kill you. But, you know, when you look at hormones in general – whether it's testosterone or estradiol and progesterone uh, for women or thyroid hormones, there's a point where you are considered optimal. You're in your early 20s. So when I was 20 years old, um, I think I was 19 years old, then 20 and 21 years old, I got blood tests done. This is a while ago. You know, we're, we're talking almost 20 years ago. And I got these blood tests done, and my testosterone level naturally was 14 to 1500 which if you look at the massive. crazy if you look at the chart right now uh-huh. it says the normal testosterone level is between 300 and like 900 so you know basically I, I did that because i told my coach when i was young i said i want to be a professional bodybuilder he said well you're not touching any steroids that's why i was asked him i said i want to take steroids i want to be a professional bodybuilder he said, well, you're not touching anything if you don't need to. You're very young. You should have a very high testosterone level. So that's why he pushed me to get these tests. So I went and got these tests, and my testosterone level's through the roof. I'm like, well, cool. I don't need it. What that did for me was give me a baseline. So I knew where it was, which is the problem with the medical industry now is that nobody's testing hormones. None of these doctors are, are getting your blood work done in this capacity and testing everything that you need to have tested, you know? So it's, it's a really weird situation where people are coming to us now and they're like, well, I don't know where my optimal range is, you know, and what is optimal? Well, we won't know. We're going to have to start you low and then we're going to increase as we go until you feel the desired effects. You know, I tell everybody, look back to when you were uh, a teenager until your early 20s, 15 or 16 to 25, right? How do people mostly feel 16 to 25? like a freaking rock star you look good you feel good you can eat whatever you want without gaining body fat i see you smiling luke you can do all these things without gaining body fat you know you have an awesome sex drive um your hair skin and nails look great you don't have any health problems right no blood pressure issues no cholesterol issues um no diabetic issues nothing you are a perfect human specimen so think of the 40 year old guys my age What starts to happen when you're getting into those ages where these hormone levels start to drop? Your blood pressure goes up. You start having cholesterol issues. You start gaining body fat. You start having depressive and anxiety issues. What are all of these things tied to? Sex drive issues, of course. So what are all these things tied to? The declination of hormones. So all we're doing is turning the clock back 
and we're putting people's hormones back in that optimal range, which is the higher end of normal, and they thrive. They start to, they start to literally uh, feel like a younger version of themselves, and, and, and they're like, oh my God, this is amazing. All of my ailments, I'm off my blood pressure meds, I'm off my cholesterol meds, I don't need my depression medication. Oh, by the way, I'm having sex with my wife nine times a week now. We didn't have sex for three months before this. I get these conversations. If you look at our Google reviews, people put this shit out there, you know? And then you get like, and then you get people saying like, oh, I can play with my kids again. You know what I mean? I have the energy to play with my kids. That's huge. These are life-changing things. So I get people saying like, oh my God, thank you so much. And then in the same sentence, they say, why the fuck didn't any of my doctors tell me this? Why didn't they check it? What is wrong with the medical industry that they wouldn't tell me this? Because the medical industry is not here to make you healthy. The medical industry is here to make money and make you a customer. That's the best way that I can put it, you know? And without getting you and I assassinated, Luke, we're not going to go into the big pharma conspiracy theories that I have. I don't have a tinfoil hat for today. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a business. It's a business. Big, big pharma is a business. They're there to make money. So if I give you, let's say you're 40 years old, Luke, and you have all these ailments, and I give you one drug that costs you 120 bucks a month, let's say, without insurance. Insurance doesn't like covering this stuff. Why? Big pharma, right? So I give you this for 120 bucks a month, and now you're off all your medications, and you feel great. What did I just do? I just cost big pharma a lot of money. You know what I mean? So that's really what we're doing. We're, we're looking at hormones from an anti-aging and a health preservation perspective. And all you have to do to get a perfect example of how this works, look at everybody in Hollywood. Why does Brad Pitt still look like he's 35 years old? You know, minus the gray hairs in here, here and there. Why does his body still look that way? Why does his face still look that way? He's been on hormone therapy since they probably started to decline. You know what I mean? I'm not calling out Brad Pitt saying he is. I assume he is. He should be. You know, he may have great genetics. But all of these Hollywood people, why do they look so young for so long? It's because they're doing all the right things. It's not just Botox. It's not superficial. They have the energy. They feel great. They're having babies. Robert De Niro just had like his ninth kid. He's like 80 years old. <laughs> why is Robert De Niro still having sex? I don't want to even think of Robert De Niro having sex. But what is different about him compared to other 80 year olds in the world that aren't on hormone therapy. That's, that's probably what it is. He's probably optimal, man. He feels good. Dude, dude, this is sick. I have so many things to go off of this. So say my baseline right now is like a 1200 testosterone sure. level, 1, 1200. And we fast forward mm -hmm. to I'm 30 yep. now. And I basically want to come into one of your clinics and start using HRT mm -hmm. and what would the exact process be with your clinic? And what do you think would be like, say the main competitive advantages of your clinic versus, cause I know you have a ton of pride. Like before this, we were talking about how you don't even want to get into franchise in the business because sure. you have such, such strict guidelines mm -hmm. of like success and like, uh, basically the brand and the services that you provide at such a high quality with your clinic. So w what are the competitive advantages and what would that look like me coming in as 30 year old, my, my, uh, testosterone levels have declined, uh, to 800. Yeah. I've fixed all of my lifestyle issues. So like I'm working out consistently, have a consistent, consistently relatively good diet. Yeah, yeah. And it's basically just where I need like the medicine. And that's, and that's what I tell people is that, you know, there's, there's levels to it. I'm not saying there's a number number that you need to hit but let's say your optimal range is 1200 if you're at 800 you probably will not feel um, a lot of issues yet I would say I would say when you would probably get to like 600 I'd say you might start feeling some some issues starting to happen so and that's different for everybody I felt like I was I had pretty much every symptom and I was in my high 600s which if you look on the scale that's high end of normal you know but that doctor, there's no way any doctor would know that my level at 20 years old or 19 years old was almost 1500. So they're not comparing that. Those, those numbers on those, on those charts are just general, based on general population. So at 30 years old, I will tell you that if you live a good lifestyle, you should not be having a hormone decline in that way. You should be still okay, but it is happening earlier and earlier. We're having people come in that are in their 20s, 
that are in their uh, you know mid to late 20s that are having these issues, all you have to do is look at the food. All you have to do is look at the water supply. What's in our water? Phytoestrogens like crazy. Um, I don't know if most people know this, but tap water, general tap water, um, even if it's filtered water, will not filter out most progestins and, uh, and synthetic estrogens out of the water. So why are men becoming smaller, weaker, more feminized, all these things? Why is it happening specifically in this country more than it is in Europe? Uh, the speculation is the prevalence of birth control. So birth control has a bunch of uh, chemically made, man-made uh, hormones that are in them. And what do they do with most women at age like 13, 14, when they, when they get their first period? Immediately on birth control. They're peeing, those, they're peeing those things out. It's getting in the water supply. Your water supply is not as clean as you think it is. You do not want to look at your water pipes that are coming into your house. If you did, you would throw up. So like my house, my house has a full uh, water filtration system for the entire house. And I have a reverse osmosis system uh, that cleans out everything, including fluoride, you know, which is another neurotoxin. Fluoride is literally known to cause uh, neurological issues and it's in our water. You know, so all the food that you're eating, all the water you're drinking, there's a lot of problems that are causing a lot of endocrine disruption. So, you know, that's why we're having younger and younger people come in. But, you know, let's say you come in, you have a hormone decline and you need, you need treatment. It's extremely easy. You're filling out paperwork. You know, it'll either be through a patient portal or it'll be through like something like DocuSign. You will get sent to go your lab work. Right now, our uh, initial cost of getting started is 250 bucks. So $250, you get your full lab panel, which is gonna be psychotically more comprehensive than any doctor has ever given you. And then you will get, after your labs come back, a full hour consultation with a practitioner where they will go line by line down everything on your lab work and tell you, this is what we suggest. The best thing about what we do is you're not paying for a membership, you're not paying for anything uh, where you're on the hook for anything. You can walk out of that consultation See ya. I don't want any treatment. You're good. And that's fine. We don't have any problem with that. We didn't make any money off you. But the thing is, is that we don't want to make money off people that don't need it. So if you came in right now, and that's not the same for a lot of clinics. A lot of clinics will try to push medications just like the old medical system does down everybody's throat that comes in that place. They'll find something wrong with you. You better believe they'll find something wrong with you and give you a medication because they want to make money. And that's what it ends up being where I'm more... I'm more ideological with this. I, I look at it as I'm gonna test your levels and I'm gonna treat you like a human. And if I don't need to, if I don't have anything for you that'll make you better that you don't need, have a good day. I'll see you in 10 years. <laughs> That's it. You know what I mean? Because everybody will eventually have this decline. So everybody will eventually get to a place where they need to start having these hormones optimized or replaced completely. And they're they're gonna be they're gonna be paying customers anyway. You know they're gonna be patients anyway. So it's not my prerogative to make everybody a patient and treat everybody like a number like that. I'm gonna treat them like I want to be treated. I want them to look at me as an individual and say, hey, we don't actually need to help you. You're in great shape. Keep doing what you're doing. Come back and check in with us if you want to get some new labs. That's that's how business is supposed to be. It's not supposed to be all a money grab. It's supposed to be. You're, you're here to provide a service to help somebody, you know? And I mean, maybe some people in business look at that and they're like, well, that's not a smart way to do business. You're not going to make any money like that. I don't know. We've done all right so far, you know? <laughs> Dude, and I love that you're the face of this brand and the the owner of the business because dude you're a physical specimen at, you. dude i've never seen somebody look so good at your age man. Thank i'm you. not I just saying it. that like if you if you guys are listening to this just on audio like guys you guys got go check out tomo's instagram like it, it, it's unbelievable yeah, i don't i don't look of, quite like, as good as my looks. i don't look quite as good at my old bodybuilding pictures but you know we'll get back there <laughs> i'm uh, i'm going to croatia i'm going to croatia in august so i'm i'm getting back in shape for that Nice, man. So in terms of people who are in Orlando or Pittsburgh mm -hmm. or like you're opening up a lot of different places we were talking about, like five different mm -hmm. uh, locations, it seems like. 
people in Orlando and Pittsburgh, what are the type of clientele that are, you see most coming into your clinic? Is it people that are running into issues or people who are on preventative measures? Like for example, myself, mm -hmm. like I'm 23 years old. I'm in, I'm in great shape. Sure. Uh, I don't, I don't have any problem, any diseases. Would you see someone like me coming into the clinic? Yeah, I think uh, somebody like you would be coming, coming in more to check in, more to, more to just look at it from a like, hey, I want to see what all my levels look like. I want to see what's going on internally. Um, and that's pretty much all we'll really end up doing for you. There's nothing you really need. You should be working at a perfectly optimal way. Uh, but when it comes to most of the clientele that are coming in, I think they're understanding that the old medical system, especially post-COVID, post-COVID has really woken people up. They know the medical system is not here to help them. They know general medicine is a, it's a money game. We saw it all through COVID. We saw the stupid testing. We saw the lockdowns. We saw the masks. We saw the vaccines. We saw all this nonsense and everybody saw it's a giant money grab. You know, companies made billions, trillions of dollars off of our tax money to push a vaccine that most people didn't even want. Yeah, it's kind of clear. So now everybody's kind of getting away from that traditional style of medicine and, you know, all these general practitioners, all these primary care doctors, not calling them out, um, ER doctors, I'm not calling all of them out. I'm just saying they had to do that, I assume, to keep their jobs. But what happened every time you went and saw one during the COVID era? Get your vaccine, get your vaccine, do this, put your mask on. No, I'm not doing that. I'm not getting a vaccine. I'm not putting my mask on. I'm not doing any of this shit because I don't need it. I'm healthy. You never needed any of that. You probably never needed a vaccine or, uh, or a mask or to social distance. You would have beat that virus all day. Who did, who did that kill? It killed very fat people and very sick people. People that were already on the one leg in the grave anyway. You know what I mean? So since that happened, I think people woke up and they're like, okay, I need to take my own health in my own hands. I need to look at this from a perspective of I'm going to have to prevent all of these things from happening which, you know, everybody's like, oh, it's normal to gain fat in old age. Okay, it probably is, you know. It's normal to uh, not have a sex drive and not have a sex life with your wife or husband when you start getting older. Okay, you know, what people don't realize is that, you know, all of those things are a modern problem. Humans were not meant to live 80 years, ever. No animal really is that, that is like us, no mammal. We probably were really meant to live about 50, 60 years and we should have been killed off in the wilderness by another animal or by disease or just by age from that point. Modern medicine, modern science, uh, modern food, water, uh, that has really put us in a place where we are living much longer. So now we have to look at a way to increase that health span since the lifespan has increased. So, you know, what's the point of living to 80 years old if from 60 to 80 you feel like complete shit? That sucks. I want nothing to do with it. You know what I mean? So how do we get ourselves to that place? Well, easy. We turn back the clock on our hormone profile. We do all the things we can with food, exercise, uh, everything like that. And we position ourselves to live as long as possible in a healthy way. You know? And we're seeing it. Science proves it. Science proves that if I have optimal hormones well into my later years in life, I will stave off all degenerative disease. No brainer. As soon as you, I don't even have to sell this shit. I tell people, you're going to live longer, you're going to feel better, you're going to look better, and you're going to want to have sex all the time. We're like, fucking sign me up. I'd give, I'll give you all of my money right now, you know? It's not, a, it's not a sales thing. It's just an education thing. It's an education thing. 100. Yeah, just because people have a bad stigma about it, they say, well, testosterone's a steroid. Sure. It's also a naturally occurring hormone in your body that's coming from your testes or in women from their ovaries at a lesser extent. You know what I mean? So what, what came first? Was it an anabolic steroid first or was it a natural hormone in your body first? It was a natural hormone in your body first. Can, can, can you break down? Because I, I, I'm definitely not that educated in the aspect of uh, testosterone, even though I had friends in the past that were bodybuilders sure. and actually like t took over like <laughs> basically illegal steroids. What's the difference between like the steroids that you give for like medicinal reasons versus like d and stuff that you were talking to like what's the entire spectrum so, of testosterone there are a ton of different anabolic uh drugs anabolic steroids um different hormone derivatives 
all of them really stem from testosterone. So when I talk about things like D-ball, Dianabol, or when I talk about things like Oxandrolone, um, which is Anivar, uh, I, I start talking about all these different drugs. They're all really derivatives of what is naturally made in the body, which is testosterone. They were all originally created to be medicine. You know what I mean? So they were all created to be actual medicine for people for different reasons. So every illegal drug that you see, illegal steroid, let's say, that you see in the bodybuilding industry, was at one time a true real drug that people were trying to get into the market or was in the market as a therapeutic. So when you look at Oxandrolone Anivar, uh, that was originally put into the market because it helped with healing. It's a, it's, a, it's a substance that's mainly made up of DHT, dihydrotestosterone, which testosterone turns into dihydrotestosterone amongst other things. But dude, I've heard of all of these, man. I, I did. Yes, I can name <laughs> a million of them, you know. So funny one, I will just tell you like Trenbolone. Everybody says Tren, right? So anybody talks about Tren. Tren is really was never made for humans. It's actually derived from an equine drug uh, called Phenoplex. It was given to cattle. It's a pellet. They used to put it in cattle to make it grow bigger muscles. Some jackass apparently uh, decided that it was good to take for humans. Yes, before you ask the question, I have taken it. It is fucking horrible. Very toxic drug. Don't ever take it. I, I, anytime any, I hear anybody talking about it, I'm like, it's not worth it. It's just not worth all the side effects and all the damage you're doing to your body. Um, but going back to like Anavar, that was made for healing properties. People that had severe third degree burns, it would help grow their skin back. Uh, they're now doing research at multiple colleges for Anavar, uh, Oxandrolone, same drug. Uh, for uh, post-surgery recovery for rotator cuff injuries because the healing properties of DHT, the hydrotestosterone, something naturally occurring in your body, will heal tissue, will grow muscle, will help you actually get over an injury or a surgery. So all of these have true therapeutic use for the most part. Some are not, elite, not legal in this country, in the United States or in Canada. Canada and the United States mirror each other on most anabolic uh, drugs. Um, and then like, if you go to like Europe, none of this stuff is controlled. A lot of stuff in Europe and Middle East and Asia, you can go right to the drugstore and buy it over the counter, you know? So when I, when I talk about it being a controlled substance or being, you know, DEA regulated, it, it is DEA regulated here really because of baseball, because it was highly abused and Congress flipped shit and they made it all controlled. <laughs> Dude, that's crazy. Cause I actually, I heard about trend a ton yeah. too, all, all of that. So, so all, all of those anabolic steroids are basically derivatives of the naturally for, for the most occurring part, hormone. yeah, for the most part, yeah. they're, they're really all stemming from that. They may not necessarily be direct derivatives. Um, some of the stuff is a hundred percent chemically synthesized, you know, and a hundred percent man-made, um, but will mimic testosterone, you know, in the body in some forms. Uh, you know, but a lot of those ones that are chemically made and, you know, made in ways that are really not supposed to be in the body, those are the ones that really cause a lot of problems. So, you yeah. know, when I tell it makes sense, when I tell people, I'm like, hey, keep it as natural. You know, people will debate me whether natural is truly natural. But if you're going to take hormones, keep it as natural as possible. Keep it, you know, your body produces testosterone. OK, supplement testosterone if you need it. Your body produces DHT from testosterone. OK, your DHT is low. Cool. Supplement something like Anivar. You know what I mean? So it, it's really it's really a simple formula when you look at it. It's just people people complicate it too much, uh, and they get into an abuse factor and they start doing crazy shit to look in crazy ways. I'm like, I get it. If you're a competitive bodybuilder and that's how you make money, you know, I'm friends with a lot of competitive bodybuilders. A lot of them come to the clinic um, for health reasons, you know. But if you're like seven time Mr. Olympia Phil Heath. Like when he was competing, I get it. He has to do this shit to look good on stage. He made a life and a career and he is very successful due to what he did. So I get it. I don't, I don't, I don't judge anybody for that thing. People jump out of airplanes with parachutes, bro. I ain't doing that ever. People jump off bridges with bungee jump with uh, bungee cords on. I'm not fucking doing that either, but I'm not going to judge him for it. You know, I don't care. Yeah. So, so <laughs> that's hilarious. Uh, it, so inside of your guys's clinic, when somebody comes in for basically the initial consultation mm -hmm. and testing, 
and they come back and it kind of is very obvious that it's a lifestyle issue yep. or your professionals in your clinic giving consultation advice on what they should be changing up in their lifestyle yes so if we have a person like your age let's say you come in and you come in you're severely mm -hmm. overweight okay uh you're 23 years old right so you're yeah. 23 you're severely overweight you're sedentary you're eating like shit um, you're not sleeping or your sleep schedule is completely just crazy, you know, staying awake all night, that, that messes with your circadian rhythm, which will in fact lower your testosterone and other hormones. So let's say you have all these lifestyle issues and you're your age, we're gonna tell that person, you need to go fix these things first. And if they don't self-correct, then come back to us and we will help you. You know, we may give them, we may give them something to help speed up the process like if they're severely overweight, like obese, obese, maybe we'll give you a weight loss drug or something to help you get kind of back to a, to a healthier standpoint. You know, but people don't realize like the biggest, the biggest epidemic or pandemic, whatever you want to call it in the West and really in the world is obesity, man. If you are obese, you are going to have problem after problem. You are going to be a detriment to yourself. Everything gets destroyed when you are too fat, you know? And, you know, circle it back to food and water, man. If you're not drinking and eating the right things and, and, you're, and you're eating all these processed foods, everything in the U.S. is built to make you fat and unhealthy. I will say it right away. And you want to know what the scariest shit about that is? Go look at who owns the big pharma companies and go look at who owns the big food companies. They're the same company. So big pharma and big food are tied. So think about how great of a racket that is, how much money they make. Big food makes you fat and sick. Big pharma fixes the problem by giving you medications for the rest of your life. They just made a billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it's nuts. And I know you see you didn't want to touch on this, but uh, like your services aren't insured like pretty much at, at all in terms of what, what you're doing. And so like, what's the reasoning behind that? in terms of like why isn't there any insurance that backs what you guys are doing it really is because they look at it in a in a perspective of it's not medically necessary i'm putting big air quotes there um it's not medically necessary they look at it in a way of it's uh oh, what's the term they use um voluntary it's like voluntary medicine so we don't see it's not a it's like cosmetic surgery kind of you know what i mean but they look at it in a way of like they don't need those hormones that that's not they don't need that they need this blood pressure medication they need this well you know who runs who runs big insurance companies they're very linked with big pharma they're very linked with you know the mainstream medical industry so it, again it all circles back to money you know so why don't why don't uh, the government subsidize things like hormone therapies that'll help so many people you know one of my one of my next goals for business is to open my nonprofit uh, which is going to be aimed towards helping veterans and first responders uh, to get these hormone therapy subs uh, subsidies uh, so they can get the treatment because depression, anxiety, and all of these things with that kind of lifestyle are prevalent in everybody. You know, I know because I did it. You know, I have um, thousands of military friends and they all suffer from the same things. And then when you check their hormones, they're all in the tank. So all their hormones are in the tank and... The VA won't treat them. Insurance won't cover them. Uh, so why why wouldn't they do that? Because it's going to fix all their problems. Big Pharma doesn't like that. Big Pharma doesn't like that I can fix all your problems with one or two medications. They want you taking 20. You know, it's really a shame. I really hate to be this, you know, cynical of how the medical industry has has come. But that's really where it is. It's it's really to a point where it's all about the money. It's, it's the, the entire government, the, all the three letter agencies, it's all money driven. It's not really ideological driven. It's not about your health. Uh, they, they don't want you healthy, man. They, they want you part of the system. They want you part of the, they want you part of the monetary circle. They want you paying in. Uh, you know, I, I don't even have health insurance. I won't pay into it. They don't cover anything. I have catastrophic insurance. Now if I get in a car accident, I break my legs or something like that. I'll be able to go to the hospital and not get billed a million dollars. But I don't have traditional health insurance because it's not worth it. They don't cover anything anyway. And half the, half the doctors that I would see, I'd probably bitch out within five minutes of seeing them. Because they're going to try to push a shitload of medications on me that I don't need. 
dude that's an amazing line right there <laughs> honestly i was looking at my bill uh the other month and was like why am i paying for this i'm never going no. i'm never going to yeah uh -huh. we we had so many people switch because we can accept hsa and fsa are you familiar with those um, uh health, no. health savings accounts and flexible savings accounts they're basically usually an additive to health insurance oh god so you can basically pay into an account and it's tax-free so it's tax-free, so you get more money in that account than you would have if you just pay for it yourself. And you put money into these accounts, you can basically use it as a checking account, like you get a little card, and you can pay for your medical bills with that. So we can accept those HSA and FSA cards, and people have completely shut off their, their medical insurance, just have catastrophic with an HSA, and now all their money that they were paying towards health insurance pays for their meds here and it ends up washing out. And they're super happy. Really good. You know? Really good really good that's great advice so Toa, we've been on this for a while and i know both of us definitely have our days to go dude i appreciate your time i want to finish off with uh just one two more questions sure i i think we got into some great topics about the clinic about your upbringing all of that like at your current time uh obviously you're providing an unbelievable service to people because you're extremely successful right now and you only get to that point when you provide very valuable services and when you are actually, uh, yeah, d doing extremely good stuff in the marketplace. And so in terms of you, would you consider yourself successful right now? And like, what is success to you? So I've, I always had a problem with this and, and I'll go back to a mindset perspective. I, I used to, so my birthday's coming up. Um, I was born in June, born June 24th. Uh, so my birthday's coming up. And I used to hate my birthday, hate it every year. And somebody asked me once and I had to think about it. And they said, why would you hate your birthday? It's like a great day to celebrate. And I said, because I feel like I didn't accomplish enough in the last year. Talk about overachieving attitude, but to a negative point. You know what I mean? You should never get to that place where I was. And, you know, I never would celebrate wins. Um, you know, I never would celebrate getting successes. Uh, and it just, it never, it never dawned on me how important it was until recently. Actually, I will credit my wife to this, uh, that she kind of pushed me to celebrating my wins and saying like, you know, when the, when the company made its first hundred thousand bucks, when we were, when we had our first hundred thousand dollar month, when we had our first quarter million month, when we had our first half million month, when, you know, when I, when I first, when I first put myself on salary, you know, what is success? To me, it's not money anymore. Um, to me, it's it's more of a freedom perspective. So, you know, I, I didn't come into this office until about 10.30 today. I can afford myself to do that, you know, but I also put into work to do that. Where, you know, if you look at me four years ago when these companies were starting, uh, I was the first one in the office and I was always the last one to leave. And you can ask some of my staff, I have slept in my office. I used to sleep on IV chairs in our first office because I couldn't go home. Um, didn't wanna go home, but I couldn't go home. I take two hour naps, I get back to work. So I was at the office sometimes, the next day they come in and they're like, do you sleep here? You look a little rough and you're wearing the same shit. <laughs> so, you know, uh, success to me is freedom. Freedom to be able to do what I want and what I like to a certain extent. Um, I am extremely strict with my schedule. Uh, when it comes to money, I have goals. So there is no success point that I think I will ever hit where I'll say, yeah, I'm, I'm a success. I have done it. You know, I have gotten to that point. For me, it's going to be goal driven. Like I want to I want to take I want to take a vacation a quarter, a big one, not a small, not like go to, you know, South Florida from Central Florida. I want to go to like Croatia quarter one. I want to go to Greece quarter two. I want to go to Japan quarter three. I, I want to be able to travel. I want to be able to have. I want to be able to have time with my family and, you know, time with my wife and, you know, uh, time with my future kid, you know, because my wife is pregnant, Luke. Um, we just found that out a few weeks back. And, you know, I want to be able, Let's go. To, be able to have that time with my family and my friends and, you know, be able to enjoy uh, the little time that we have left, you know. If uh, there's a great calendar, you can go and uh, look it up online and it basically has you uh, black out each day and there's ones that are each week of your life up until like 100 years old. 
and you fill them all up until where you are now, and then when you see how many black dots are left, you're like, oh fuck, I don't have a lot of time, you know? So what is success to what is success to anybody? You're gonna have to figure it out, but don't be negative about not hitting those successes. I wanted to I wanted to be at a certain point, uh, and I've I've not reached some goals, and I have reached some goals, and you have to you have to look at it in a perspective of I achieve certain things, and there's still more that I have to achieve, but always measure backwards. Don't always be looking forward. Have your goals. Have your one month, three month, one year, five year goals. But always measure backwards and realize where you came from. My family came from a communist country. You know, I I was we were broke. I mean, we were living in efficiency apartments when I was growing up. Uh, you know, I was a cop. I'm making sixty five thousand a year, seventy thousand a year. Uh, I was ecstatic when I when I had my first hundred thousand dollar year. But I worked eighty hours a week. You know what I mean? So you know, and now. I don't even care about money. It doesn't matter anymore. Money is not a not a not even on my radar. I don't look at bills. You know what I mean? Is that success? Maybe to some people, you know, but if you measure backwards and you always look about where you started, even measuring yesterday, am I doing better today than I did yesterday? Did I fuck up yesterday? You know, did I count did I check off my list yesterday? I didn't. Okay. Well don't don't dwell on it, but hey, I checked off today. You know, and if you fuck up today, but you did better yesterday, you can still measure backwards and say, hey, I might have fucked up today, but yesterday I did great. Keep yourself in that positive loop where you can always say, hey, I am a success and I am measuring my success and I know where I started and I have my goals where I'm going. Will I hit them all? I don't know, man. I want to make a billion dollars a day. Is it achievable? I don't fucking know. Maybe. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, dude, it's so accurate of constantly having the perspective. And I, I think personally in terms of uh, that's where a lot of my happiness comes from is the perspective of like seeing all of the massive failures that have been overcome and uh, being excited about what what more failures and what more uh, hardship is going to be in the future. Because I'm like, damn, if I got through that, like I can get through. And you're just absolutely starting. You're just starting. You're still a young man. I mean, yeah, I you know. Got, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of fuck ups you're still going to go through, you know? I know I, I am really young, but we, I've actually been doing this for uh, seven years now. I know. So I, saw I, I started this in, in grade 10 of high school. So it, it, it's been, it's been a good journey. Uh, and I'm, I'm super glad about that in terms of uh, this is a kind of probably the last question I want to ask uh, with success in terms of like how money isn't an issue anymore. Genuinely curious. Like, do you have, an extreme amount of stress in your life like do you wake up stressed ever do you go to sleep stressed ever since money is like somewhat I, I would say even if you don't look at bills i would say it's probably still in the picture like you have massive payroll mm -hmm. and so is there stresses like in everyday life i think there's always going to be stresses but you have to you have to decide whether you're going to look at stress in one way or another um, if you look at it in a psychology term, it's uh, something called distress and something called eustress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S. So eustress is a positive form of stress. Distress is obviously a negative form of stress. So do I have stress? Yes. Are they negative stressors? I would say no. Um, do they sometimes get overwhelming? Absolutely, of course. Everybody's going to have things. I mean, you blow your tire out on the highway or something like it's stressful it sucks you know what I mean it's something annoying um, but waking up in the morning no I don't think I have any stress you know I, I think I look at it as a positive like uh, you can look at anything in a negative and a positive light so you know I have a massive payroll uh, you know are we are we lower on funds I don't know maybe we're maybe we're cutting it close this month on funds because we just invested X amount into a new business so maybe we're low on funds. Can I look at it in a stressful manner in a negative way? Of course. Can I look at it in a way that's positive? I would say I almost always do it that way, where I look at it in that you stress environment and I say, well, fucking make more money. That's it. If you just look at it from that perspective and people say, well, that's stupid. That, that's just simplifying the whole thing. Well, life is simple, really. And business is simple and finances are simple. You know, now if you're being stupid about your money and your finances and you over leverage yourself, yeah, you, you put yourself in that position, you got to get yourself out of it. 
But if you're looking at it from a perspective of, hey, this is, this is something like, I just hired all these new staff members. Why did I hire them? I hired them because we're growing. I hired them because we hit X amount of patients. I hired them because we just opened three more clinics. So that's positive. Can it be, can it be looked at as stressful? You know, yeah, sure, it can be. But again, it's the mindset shift. It's the way that you have to look at things to keep yourself rolling. I work best under pressure, you know? So like when everything's going very smooth, I start to get like antsy. You know what I mean? Most entrepreneurs, yeah. most entrepreneurs are like this. Most entrepreneurs, people that own businesses and keep opening businesses, we're all like this. We're all a little bit psychotic where when everything looks beautiful and great, we're like, okay, we need to blow something up or we need to build something new to, to get my brain working again. And I've been there. I've, I've done it before, you know, but it's, it's all about kind of rolling with the punches. It's all about getting to a place where, where you understand that managing your stress in a more positive way is always going to benefit you in life and in business, uh, rather than looking at it in a distress form. Dude, absolutely amazing. In closing comments, Tomo, uh, it, say somebody is in the modern uh, system, basically, and is trying to get out. They, they're, they've been a part of big pharma. They've been doing everything. Like, they might be fat, poor, like, weak. Sure. What, what would be your best advice for first steps of getting out of that place? So get yourself, get yourself healthy. Um, you know, uh, one of my favorite people, and people will get pissed about this one, especially women, uh, is Andrew Tate. And take it or leave it. People hate him. I understand why. I get that he's very brash and he, he kind of says some shit off the cuff. Um, the one thing that I really, really like about him is that he puts personal responsibility on everybody. So he's like, okay, you're depressed. And he tells a story all the time about this guy that emailed him. All right, you're depressed. Go to the gym and get a six pack. That's what he said to the guy. He said, go to the gym and get a six pack. If you're still depressed at the end of that, I don't know what to tell you. Go kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I wouldn't say that like that. That's kind of fucking crazy. But it's Andrew Tate. That's just kind of how he talks. So, you know, this guy goes and gets a six pack. What happens? What happens? What is, what is the process of getting a six pack? You're eating healthier. You're working out. You're putting your mind and your effort into something that is positive, you know? So, so you're getting yourself into, into a place that is a more a more positive, a more fulfilling, a more, uh, I don't know, future outlook kind of place where, where you know that you are doing this work. Nobody can get you a six pack, by the way. You have to put in the work. You have to eat right. You have to train right. You have to live that life. So anybody that's in that place, we'll put it very simple. Go to the gym and get a six pack. Oh, I can't afford a gym membership. Fuck off. There are people in jail that do it. Go outside and do push-ups and sit-ups and pull-ups on a, on a tree right out here and go run every day. I guarantee by the time you get yourself to that healthy place, you're going to feel better, you know? So you want to get out of that cog. You want to get out of that wheel. And I'm not talking about people that have like, you know, crazy medical issues. I'm talking about everyday people. Go and fix your lifestyle because I will tell you right now, the people that I see out and about, you know, that are overweight, that are depressed, that are eating the shit that I see them eating, drinking way too much caffeine, like this, constantly on their phone all day, bro, all day. And I mean, I, me and you were on social media, and I know me and you were not on this thing 24 hours a day. You know what I mean? So, you know, limiting yourself, getting outside, go, go outside, go do shit, go be a part of real life. It's going to it's going to make everything kind of better um, all around. Not just business, not just not just your health. It's going to be all around. You're going to have just a better life. So you know if you're in that place, go get yourself in a lifestyle healthy place. Now if all of that is already done and you still have a bunch of problems and you're in that you're in that wheelhouse of big pharma, don't even come to my clinic. I don't even care. It doesn't even have to be a doesn't even have to be an Aspire Rejuvenation Clinic. Go anywhere and get your blood work done. It takes five minutes and it's usually less than a couple hundred bucks. Get your blood work done. Get it looked at by a trained practitioner, a trained professional, and see what's going on internally. It may be something so easy. It could be a thyroid thing that you didn't even know you had. And you fix that thyroid thing and you're good. There's no problems now. 
How easy is that? But you know what? Your normal medical system, your normal medical doctors are not going to look at it that way. So you have to go outside of the normal big pharma realm and you have to look for something outside of that and take control of your own health and take control of your own life and get out of this system that they're creating for everybody here because the system doesn't work. It's failing. So it's time for you to get back to the old school. Take care of yourself. You get yourself to a point where you take care of yourself, everything works. Dude, it's amazing. Uh, guys, put your health number one priority in life. Uh, it'll, it'll solve everything. It'll get you guys to that next level. Uh, get you guys your self-confidence back. Just make everything easier, putting that as the number one priority. So guys, this was Tomo on this podcast. He's been an absolute gem. I know you guys have gotten a ton of value from this. We're going to link all of his social media channels below whatever platform you're watching this on. So definitely go check him out. Check out his clinic, especially if you're in Orlando or Pittsburgh right now. Aspire Rejuvenation Clinic. Uh, I, I'm personally going to go there next time that uh, I'm in Orlando or uh, or Pittsburgh for so, sure. We come to Orlando every once so in a while. So Luke, actually, uh, there is something that we do call telemedicine. It is still it is still happening. So we can actually help people outside of our local areas, and you can actually see everything virtually with our practitioners. So that is still an option. So if anybody, that's yeah, amazing. anybody still outside of uh, the Orlando or Pittsburgh area, we can still see you, we can still help you, and we can still prescribe to you. Fantastic. So what would be the best way of doing that? Going onto your website and emailing contact? Right on the website, aspirejuvenation.com. You can uh, put in a lead form. Our patient care team will reach out to you within 24 hours. Good to go. Fantastic. That's aspirejuvenation.com. This is Tomo. Or Janovic, this was an absolutely amazing conversation. I got a ton of value out of it. Uh, this is actually my first time ever talking with Tomo, so this was <laughs> this was super dope. But yeah, guys, this is the High Key Podcast. I'm your host on this podcast, CEO Luke Lentz of High Key Enterprises. And yeah, until the next one. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thank Tomo. You.